Mbeza Mkele and I'm a legal professional and I'm a writer and I'm passionate about like women's rights that's my thing actually just public interest law human rights that's like my turf and right now I'm just trying to make my way into like establishing a career in that so yeah and I'm also trying to write a lot I'm trying to explore my writing so that's who I am hey hi my name is Ntati Mabena and I'm a black queer woman um I do identify as a feminist um definitely more on the radical um what do we say post colonial side of feminism um and i how do I interact with the world as a queer woman um well, I think that i i mean I've always um been very vocal about my blackness because I've had to like shift in between so many different worlds. Um, so I come from a township, but I've gone to like private schools and, um, you know, kind of had a lot of friends in a, like a upper economic or social class than me. And so, um, I've like kind of learned how to move between the two worlds, multiple worlds. And um, in terms of my queerness, um, I treat it just the same. So I like, I'm quite adamant on being vocal about it um, because I interact with a lot of people that don't have, like I have a lot of non-queer friends and a lot of cisgender friends. So um, I obviously like, I'm vocal about it just so they don't um, like perpetuate things that I feel are harmful because they might not have like access to the education or information about the experience of being a queer woman. Um, um, and yeah, like I said, this, that's the same with my blackness. I think um, those two, um, like my most important identity markers, just, yeah, my blackness and my queerness, um, my womanhood as well. But I don't think it's, um, I don't know, maybe it's something that I take for granted because I am cisgender, right? And although women are um, discriminated against, definitely not as much as women that are not cisgender, um, so non-binary and trans women. Um, yeah, so I think it might be something that I take for granted in the sense that um, I think about it, but not as much as I think about like my blackness or my queerness, yeah. There's so many things that need to be addressed when it comes to like women's issues and obviously like i think the biggest one is um you know gender-based violence is like all like all this violence against women and you know and obviously vulnerable people that's like the biggest thing and then um i think i was telling you about how i wanted to do my master's right in like sexual and productive um health rights and i think that's another thing that's being um like that, how women are neglected because I've noticed, like I've seen people who we have these rights, but then we can't really access them, right? Uh, we have like all these things, all these places put, um, no, never mind. We have like all these uh, facilities in place for us to like get these rights, for us to um, find protection, for us to, you know, go for family planning and things, but then we can't really access those rights because when you go to such places, you are ignored or your problems are just trivialized or you are shamed, you know, like you have young girls being shamed because, you know, they want to be on contraceptives. You have women turned away from police stations because you, they, a, a police officer will feel like they, whatever they're complaining about, like their complaints is not really valid. It's not serious. So I think that's where my, my politics is. I, I want women to be seen. I want women to be heard. I feel like um, that's, not, that's not a reality right now. I want women to be safe. Like that's actually like the number one thing. I want women to be safe. I feel like we always have to be cautious with, with everything and everywhere and like with everyone around us. So I don't know if that makes sense, but like that is my politics, you know? Um, one thing that I do kind of think about sometimes is um, this like 
issue of the male gaze and how to like kind of live your life not worrying about it when you're attracted to men so it's kind of difficult because you want to like win the attention of men if you're like a woman who's attracted to men but um at the same time the male gaze is very harmful and like the attraction of men can be dangerous like to your actual physical safety um so i think for me that's one thing that i experience a bit differently is like i don't want male attention at all you know i don't have that um like trying to navigate between the two of like wanting male attention but from men that will respect me as a woman and respect all people um i kind of like if they're not a friend that i trust or my dad or an uncle that i trust you know i like i'm very quick to dismiss me dismiss um men that i don't know because i yeah i feel very uncomfortable around them um and so i think that there might be a disconnect there like with women that are attracted to men um versus me um i don't i'm i'm yeah i'm just generally uncomfortable around men and i don't care too much about attention from them um so that yeah that might be very difficult especially for a south african woman you know we're all aware of gender based violence and how dire the situation is um so I can't imagine like being attracted to men but also being scared of them and how like do you draw the line for yourself or like just how how do you navigate that I don't know that might be one thing I know for sure I experienced differently like if I talk to some of my friends that are attracted to men um that's something that I experience like differently um so I I guess I'm I'm more critical of men because I don't care like if they're you know gonna have like an adverse reaction to that to my criticism um um but I, I, like as mm, but I don't think like my attraction to people that are not men makes a difference on how I experience womanhood um especially cuz I identify as like um mostly feminine um and there are some gender roles that like i've been like brought up in and like i have, like i'm very domesticated um not really by choice but i like can relate with a lot of women on those kinds of things because i like grew up that way is like very feminine domesticated like doing girl things quote unquote so um i don't think that my attraction to people that aren't men like really affects um like how i connect with other women no not necessarily uh my name is theavna sabroyan i am currently a final year student law student at the university of pretoria um i grew up in durban and then i moved here when i in pretoria when i was 16 years old and i've been here ever since um and i have always had a passion for social justice as a young age because i came from a really small town uh near durban and you know just seeing how people lived how the dynamics were with people be it children adults um male female you know all of that it i always observed it as a younger person and i thought to myself well surely this is not right you know and yeah you know, i was really lucky that i had parents especially in, i grew up in a a tight knit brown community and you know it, a lot of people had the same idea on you know what it was to be a woman what was it like to you know fit in a society that was primarily dominated by the patriarchy and my parents are really lucky never really abided to that and you know allowed my sister and myself as just being the only children in the family to for my own opinions and see you know what was right what is wrong um you know how you as a woman should battle the patriarchy and um my name is Bulumko Mbete I am a 25 year old black woman from i guess a multicultural family I would not consider myself a feminist but 
I would definitely consider myself as someone who supports and rigorously is committed to the betterment of this, the, the state of society in terms of how, how it supports, relates to, and views women. Um, but I, I don't think I could use the label of feminist because I don't necessarily like study the doctrines or know the different types of feminist, feminism that exists. So I can't really say that I commit to that. Um, but yeah, that's basically the way I see myself. So I am a black South African woman, um, but I'm also someone who is very interested in, I guess, the state of women beyond the borders of South Africa because all of our, I guess, um, contexts are very similar but very different according to the different societies and cultures we, or subcultures we form part of in different ways. Um, hi, my name is Mayaman. I am from Sudan. I'm 23 years old and I'm a lawyer by profession. Um, being a woman, uh, means to me that, um, or being a woman in Africa, let's say, if not in just Sudan, um, we're always in a struggle to, um, to, um, to establish a place for ourselves where we are treated equal and we are looked at uh, based on the level of, um, the level of, um, uh, professionalism that we have, the uh, the level of um, the achievements that we've done, not just because I'm a woman, I cannot do this. So where I come from, women are really contributing. They they've contributed to a lot of uh, a lot of human rights movement, um, and they've been like uh, they played a major role in the uh, in the latest uh, revolution uh, in 2019. And without women without the role that, that women played, it wouldn't have happened. And then again, after this has happened, you find that women are not given the place that they deserve um, in the political atmosphere spe specifically, uh, whether it's in parliament, whether it's in, in the public uh, positions, women are fighting, we're, 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 we had campaigns, um, um, requesting for or demanding that we we have 50 50 share in the public offices but no it's not happening the the constitutional document comes and gives women 40 percent and uh, yeah so it's really it's just a continuous fight fight i think for the for the sudanese revolution we as women we were lucky that that picture was, was captured because um it like it became viral worldwide and it showed how women um, they have the strength to lead revolutions and to be in the front lines and I wouldn't be exaggerating if I said that with the Sudanese revolution maybe 70 percent of the protesters were women women were um, even before the sit-in they were participating in their in their protest they were getting arrested they were getting you know, like they were just playing a really major and heroic part in the revolution. And during the sitting, doctors were participating. Uh, they were cooking for the protesters. They were, they were there through the, throughout the whole thing. So I think even after the success of the revolution, then they should be there as well. Not just because, um, because they're, they're women and then they should give us no it's our right to be given uh, my name is emma paulette and i am a south african woman which means that i'm very tired despite my white privilege so i can only imagine how tired other south african women are um i am a contract lecturer at the university of pretoria and i think it's taruna just slightly <laughs> problematic that we, like we always define ourselves according to our jobs um it's difficult to you know stop and think who am i um apart from my job description and um my achievements like who am i at my core um i personally struggle to define myself um in any other way that isn't my job description or like my degrees 
for example. Um, so I don't really know who I am. <laughs> this is going so well. But yeah, I think it's like just part of me is like the titles, you know, what, I, what am I under that? But this is, I'm probably getting too philosophical, stripping back too many layers. This is too deep now. But yes, if, if you want to include it in the video, I am also a bit of a creative. <laughs> yeah, I think like I said in the beginning, just being a woman in South Africa is tiring um, because we are not safe. And it's frustrating to me that it is so normalized um, that I've internalized the fact that I'm like, I don't even think about, I would never dare, you know, sort of go for a walk by myself. And um, yeah, just the fact that it doesn't even occur to me to even try do things like that, because I just know that I'm potentially asking for trouble by doing so. Um, and it's very frustrating to me because I try to be a strong, independent woman, but um, uh, just I guess the systems that are in place uh, mean that it's very easy to kind of, yeah, well, we're not taken seriously. We, we've discussed this as well, um, that there's not enough in place or what's in place isn't sufficient in um, protecting our rights, our freedom of movement, etc., cetera. And um, other things that really annoy me, um, apart from, you know, capitalism and the patriarchy generally, is just the audacity of people and um, how easy it is, for example, to be raped or sexually assaulted, molested just because you've been drinking alcohol, um, the way men seem to think that they have a right to your body, um, just makes me really, really angry. And it's something I, I haven't been thinking about lately um, because I, I sort of just suppress <laughs> these things that make me angry. Um, but yeah, so I think I'm just saying angry a lot now, Taruna. My name is Janet, of course. Okay, Janet. And um, um, I don't even want to go into the professional aspect, so I'll just say I'm Janet. I'm a woman and who has had to, on a daily basis, confront the challenges and also the benefits of being a woman. Challenges because um, there are avenues that you would constantly have to do so much more than the ordinary person would do just because you're a woman. And then um, the privileges that come with being a woman, also because by people underestimating you and thinking you're a woman, you get the opportunity to just wow them and show them that, guys, I am just someone who really just wants to make a difference. So it, it, in using the privilege to an advantage where I'm constantly letting people know that, oh, I'm not just your ordinary girl. I can really do whatever you think it is that I cannot do. So that's the positive part of being a woman. But um, yeah, it's a continuous journey. I can't really say, oh, this is it. This is, this is really how it is. I think as, as each avenue, as each phase of life unravels, you get to appreciate each stage as you move on. So yeah, that's just it. Okay, thank you. And I wanted to ask, um, being a Nigerian woman living in South Africa, what has been your experience of the environment? Okay, so um, I would say um, the first thing is, please don't go near a South African man or oh, those people. <laughs> Okay, but that is also me being very biased because um, we'd constantly seen so much that happens, especially in relation to violence against women. You're scared of, um, okay, let me say it literally. If you can do that to someone who is your sister, who is from your place, imagine what you would do to me. So it makes it very difficult to then go close to men who are South African because of the fear of, of the hopes that I mean, if he finds me, he will do so much worse to me. The violence that would be, you know, met, sent out to me would be so much more than what is, um, yeah, but I think basically I've also had to be, I, I try to be as positive as possible. 
So I've had really incredible friends, amazing guys who are constantly trying to change the narrative. And I try not to use a blanket approach to, to say, oh, every man in South Africa is this, is that. Because I've had amazing people who are my friends who are constantly doing their best to see that a lot is changing and the narrative is changing. So I would just say overall, being a woman is hard. That's all I would say in South Africa, in Nigeria, all over the world, being a woman is hard. Generally, like the women movement since the beginning, all across Africa, in different countries, in Sudan and South Africa, they've achieved, they, they, they've really achieved um, remarkable, uh, remarkable um, aims or goals of the women movement. But then again, it's our part to continue with it because we're not there yet. As long as women are not treated equally, are not feeling safe in their countries, in the public space, are not looked at as uh, equal citizens. Um, and so, yeah, I guess like they gave us the, the burden of continuing the past. So this is what we have to do. I think globally the challenges between women everywhere are almost similar, especially in the African context where we have to confront the cultural aspects of the silence of a woman. So a woman is seen as, oh, you have to be silent, oh, you're too loud, oh, you have to wait and to wait for opportunities, wait to, for your turn to speak, wait for your turn to sit at the table, just keep waiting, 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 and seeking the permission to do something. So it's a general thing. It's all over. It's not just South Africa. It's in Nigeria. It's in Kenya. It's in every part in fact even in the so-called west that um they pride in um you know being very advanced especially in in projecting the equality agenda it's just the same women face the same situations everywhere i mean people you may have um an, a circumstance where you're living with people doing a lot of things together and being a badass until you have the opportunity to take up positions of influence it is at that moment that you begin to know where people remember that you are a woman. And um, by just being female it's, um, or being a woman, it is now difficult for people to trust you enough to give you those responsibilities. Hi, everybody. I'm Zakia. And the mom shaming thing is really real. So people do, um, I don't know, they, they say things like when... For, for example, at my son's first birthday, he was quite sick. He was not terribly sick, but he just, he had a cold and it, I get really stressed out about things like this. So if, if, if you were sick, I would be very stressed out and I would be like panicking and thinking, I'm going to have to leave work. I'm going to have to leave the students for like a week. I don't know what's going to happen to them. So I was saying it to my parents and another family overheard and they're like, well, you as a mother should stay at home and look after him. And my husband was right there. So I was thinking, why shouldn't my husband also be staying at home? Why, why is that being forced onto me? So, it, you know, it's those kinds of inequalities that really, I don't know, that's been emphasized and highlighted. And it's, it's something that I'll be quite vocal about because I feel passionate that it shouldn't be that way, that, you know, we, we should be treated in a, in a way that we feel is correct for us and, and what sits right with us is how we should be um, living our lives. My name is Lara Oriye and I am Nigerian and I'm a lawyer and a human rights uh, activist from Nigeria. So how do I interact with being a woman? I think that for the longest time it was, it felt like a fight, like a consistent like fight. You know, I never had down times. I made all sorts of rules about how I would live my life because I just needed to be able to live in a world where I was seen and recognized and treated like a human being. And that unfortunately is still kind of like the fight, but that's now somehow, you know, a part of a bigger identity, a part of a more well-rounded identity, right? Because for the longest time, you know, as, uh, as an African girl, and in this case, a Nigerian girl, it was a major issue to be addressed as you would like, to be treated as you would like. You know, the, it felt like there was this pre-existing template of how you would be addressed and how you would be treated. And it didn't really matter if you felt that that was right or wrong. It just felt like this is what must be done. 
and this is how you must react to it. And then that didn't really, really leave room for, you know, a lot of self, a lot of, uh, a lot of like individualism, right? If, if that would work. And yeah, I remember that for the, for the longest time I was called strong headed. I was called all sorts of names actually, you know, there are some unprintable ones, but <laughs> I've been called like all sorts of names. And interestingly, it's all started to make sense as I grew older, right? It kind of started to make sense on some level there was acceptance on some level there was you know a pushback like that's not gonna happen that's not how you're gonna treat me that's not how you're gonna talk to me but in general i feel like the most predominant aspect of being a woman for me has been the consistent fight to be seen and not just in like maybe your career or whatever just to be recognized as a full human being with rights and agency that has been the biggest fight and you know bringing that to south africa you know interestingly when i was a child i was introduced to like the history of south africa and so many things actually and i kind of like really resonated with that and i always thought that when i got here i was going to feel like it was going to be like a revelation i was going to feel like something finally happened but yeah on some level it's felt that way on some level, it hasn't. But yeah, that's basically who I am. I think that there is definitely so much coherence. There is definitely so much, you know, there's so much uh, that there's so much that is alike with my experiences, and so much that we can basically like, you know, join our voices together on. So on the issue front of things, it's been yeah, almost the same thing. You know, it's 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 interesting to experience, you know. The, some level of blatant misogyny that I've experienced here. And I think that the biggest issue for me is that many times I tell myself, you're a Nigerian woman, walk away, right? And so I feel like I've been silenced a little bit on that front. Because look, if, it was in, if I was back home, I, everyone knows me to be like the one who sets everyone straight. <laughs> if there is an issue, I bring it up, I fight until somebody passes out, and it's not going to be me, you know, I, I go to the extreme. I, but here, I've noticed that on many occasions, I let things go. I just keep quiet and move on. And I've also noticed that that is not peculiar to me. My reason may be different, but I feel like it's been a thing that is common with women out here. I, I've learned so far that many people feel like, many, many, many people feel the need to let things go because they're trying to protect themselves, their family, their children and all of those things. And that's like a weird intersection that women find themselves all the time, you know, we're in that intersection where there's so much connected to us and there's so much connected to our reaction to the things that we face. So sometimes we kind of have to choose, you know, peace, even though I constantly reiterate that peace without justice is oppression. And so I have taken my place as an oppressed person because I, I know that those circumstances do not end peacefully. What peace means to me is justice. What peace means to me is a reinstatement of my dignity. But in the absence of that, I have embraced my identity as someone who is oppressed and who may not be able to do anything about it in the near future. And that, that realization basically is something I have seen in so many spheres of South Africa. So, I don't know too much about South Africa, so I'm not going to speak on a, on a like huge, like a general level. But with my personal experience on South African Twitter, with human beings that I've interacted with, I've seen so much, you know, so much oppression and so much need for us to continue to live with that oppression because we don't want to usurp all these things that are connected to our identity as women. The lineage of women I come from, like as much as they have like very strong political and leadership positions um, throughout their life, like within the armed struggle, the anti-apartheid movement, um, within the, the democratic government at different stages since the advent of democracy, I also have personal relationships with them which are very different to what the relationship to I guess governance um, 
and social activism would be. So I know them in a very different context and relate to them in a very different context. But yeah, I, I guess like I come from a very, uh, what's the word? I guess political royalty, if I could describe it as that. So it is something that I'm very proud of because I feel like I've always been made aware of myself beyond like being, I guess, selfish or only looking at who you are and how you, how you move in society. Like it's always been about considering how you can empower others and make a contribution to the freedom of other people. Um, so yeah, I could say I'm very proud. I can name some of my family members. Um, so my grand's name was Cynthia Florence Fraser. Um, one of my aunts is Geraldine Fraser. My mother is Deborah Mbet, sorry, Deborah Fraser, <laughs> Deborah Fraser rather. Um, and one of my aunts is Baleka Mbete. Um, yeah, and I have other family members that have been very active, but I mean, that's, yeah, those are the, I guess, most notable figures that I could mention, um, all very active in the anti-apartheid and struggle movement. Um, there are lots of stories that I could share, but I would rather they would share those. Um, but yeah, I come from a very like strong, resistant family with very resilient women who have been active, I guess, since their teenage years in um, transforming South African society and making a contribution, especially as women, and had very strong views against patriarchy and not necessarily having to use the label of patriarchy to resist it. Um, I think the spaces that they've um, taken up positions in have allowed them to be able to exercise that in, in many ways, in some ways not, but in the same breath, they were kind of, I guess, representative and brought diversity into those environments. To be quite honest, I don't think like there is a specific woman, like besides my mom, but there isn't a specific woman. Honestly, um, every day in, in like, my, my, like my everyday life, with the, the various women that I encounter, like in different ways, they inspire me. It's like, sometimes you don't even have to um, um, engage the person for a long time just to like glean something from them. And I feel like the women in South Africa, there's a lot that I learn and there's, and there's like the way in which they act in which they carry themselves sometimes, it, like it's so inspiring. So I don't have like a specific person. I feel like women, like South African women as a whole, they are inspiring. I feel like if you just go outside and you just like see the way, you know, people are, like the way women are, it is inspiring. Because I look up to different people at different times. For instance, I could say, oh my God, Tirina, I like how you speak. I am, oh, I just want to be like you in that aspect. That's it. Oh, my elder sister, she is so calm. I wish I had a more diplomatic way of handling issues that um, like she does. That's it. Oh, my mom, she was a very domesticated person. I wish I can just speak a few aspects of her. So I think if with me, there is no one person fits all because um, it's difficult to also know people's um, silent struggles. So I just speak at different points. I mean, it could really be a little girl who I see so much in her and I just want to giggle and laugh like she is laughing at that moment. So there is no single person that I can say, oh, this is it for me. So I just speak different things from different people at every time. And I also think I have not really been so fortunate to have a proper female mentor. But that's what I'm constantly doing. I try to reach out to a lot of young women as much as I can. So that's all that I couldn't have someone can categorically say, oh, Janet, was it for me? She was, you know, all that I wish I had, I'm trying to do be for others. So that, um, yeah, someone can sit somewhere and say, oh, Janet, was it for me? Um, I would say my mother being a person that I've seen go through so much of, of this type of, um, you know, and, and her whole life has been shape, shaped by it um, from 
wanting to study, um, you know, having a tertiary education and her parents saying to her that, look, you're not allowed to go, go to university because you're going to meet boys. So somebody was denied of that, that opportunity for a really, you know, t t like discriminatory re reason and, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, difficulty she faced um, with my father's family, the ways that she's been treated. And yet she's never lost her sense of pure innocence. I, I don't know if that's a correct way to describe it, that, you know, it's, it's almost like this childlike quality, faith in life and, and joy of life. And um, the, the irony is that a, a lot of families do bring up uh, their daughters and, and in our maybe Indian culture, they bring up um, women to, to feel, to become more homely. But in my family, it was really different. So even my grandparents who, who denied my mother tertiary education, they made some transformations themselves. And it was really important to them that all of their grandchildren were educated and did receive a tertiary education. So um, from the time I can remember, we have always been, and, and that's maybe the stereotypical part, is being pushed academically. Um, and, and not to the extent that you need to be like the best in the class, but you need to be able to do your best at all times. And for them, it was important because they wanted all of the women in the family to be independent and empowered. And that value system, I think, I've, it, it was ingrained in me and my mother has always, um, you know, she, she's always encouraged us and, and uh, enabled us and inspired us to, to pursue that. And um, she still does that for me today. I mean, the other day I just ha had this memory, like when I was in high school, I really enjoyed studying French and my school didn't offer the subject French. So I did it through the Alliance Francaise. So I did it as an extra subject. And my mother, I don't know what, she, she always had these like ambitions and, and it wasn't like a kind of thing where she like, you know, like how you're like maybe in some families, they want you to become a doctor or something like that. But she knew that I was passionate about it. So I don't know what it, the discussion was, but she told the director, oh, and one day Zakia will be the director of this place kind of thing. And it's just a nice memory that I kind of had that she always has like the, the such faith in us and in our capabilities and in our potential that um, it wasn't a thing to put pressure on us, but it was more just having so much uh, belief in us that, that we managed to internalize that and have self-belief as well. So in both, uh, or all three of us, my sister, brother, and I, we've always pursued what we were passionate about and had that self-belief that we can do it because I, I think it's because of my mother and her kind of building us up in that way. So she is my inspiration, I would say, um, definitely, and continues to be. Um, be that way um yeah i know this is gonna sound cliche but i'm gonna say my mom um my mom she has four daughters i'm included and in the household um she made sure that we are always treated equally whatever we do our brothers do um she she made sure that um we follow her, her her lead in the women movement, whether in the society, um, establishing campaigns, um, not being silent. Whatever you go through, you have the right to speak up. Um, so, I believe like if uh, if we can start with that, in each and every household where the woman or the mom or the mother is supportive to her to her daughters, then we can get strong women who can stand up for their rights who can stand up for uh for what they believe in who can not like um, be submissive to the society and the um, the cultural views or the men in their lives so yeah it's a short answer but i really believe in this like get a good mom and strong daughters and strong women will emerge to the society I, I, use, I draw inspiration from two major women in, in my feminist, in my womanist journey. And one of them is um, Sumilaya Ransom Kuti. She was one of the um, earliest nationalists in Nigeria. And even though much, much of, her, much of uh, history was erased and suppressed in like the history of Nigeria, it's, uh, she was an individual who 
had so many sides to her, right? So I was doing some research last year about like the history of Nigeria and I found out that not twice, not three times, did Fumilayo Ransom Kuti organize a protest against white supremacy and colonialism in Nigeria. You know, one of those protests is, uh, is quite popular. The idea that she, she got the other women in the community to protest naked and they fought against excessive taxation imposed by the colonial government through, the, through their monarchs, right? And Fumila Ransom Kuti is, usually, is generally known as the first Nigerian woman to drive a car, but she was way more than that. She was a woman who, was, who had major convictions about her dignity and was not going to beg for it and was not going to earn it. She, she really lived a life that, that proved to Nigerian women that we, are in, we inherently possess dignity and we must be treated as such. So yes, Mila Ransom Kuti is one of my earliest inspirations. She's amazing. She's, you know, and she wasn't a perfect woman. And that is actually one of my major reasons why I really resonate with her, right? Because I don't believe that we get to be leaders or we get to, we, we, we don't have to earn our dignity by being well behaved. And she really like gave me that template to work with. I think the other woman is Winnie Mandela. Let me tell you, I, I spent so many years obsessed with Winnie Mandela and I, I, I still, I'm still moderately obsessed, to be honest, you know, because she is not just like, you know, a representation of strength. She's also a representation of vulnerability. She's a representation of, she makes, it, makes us know that as women, we don't deserve to be respected or dignified only for good behavior. We get to be actual human beings with multifaceted lives and we all and in, even in that state we deserve our dignity. She's a vision of resilience, she's a vision of grit. She's what I think about when I think of women who carry movements across generations, right? I also really look up to Janet Mock. Um she's the like co-creator of Pose. Um, so Pose is an American TV series, the drama series. Um, I think it's on Netflix now, it should be. And so I, I really uh, like look up to Janet Mock because she um, is doing so much for trans representation in media. And I think she did such a good job of like intentionally casting trans people and queer people in um, those characters, because I, I was just like really sick of seeing, um, um, so I mean, obviously because I'm queer, I do watch like more queer media than most people. And like from everything, like all the like, the cult series, you know, queer cult series, like the L Word and that kind of thing, like they had costed, made some really bad costing decisions and a lot of like representation decisions in um, terms of like costing straight people or cisgender people in queer and um, trans roles and um, giving them credit when there are so many um, trans people and queer people that are in the entertainment industry that are looking for work that are looking to play like roles where they don't get killed in a brutal way or they're not shown as like sick or destitute or doing something like demeaning in order to survive which I mean might be the case for like a group of queer or trans people, but it's very like harmful um, for them to be portrayed that way over and over again, because if you're not in the community, then that's all that you see and that becomes, you know, your idea or your perception of queer and trans people. So I really like appreciate what Janet Mock has done with Pose. It's the biggest queer and trans show I've seen ever. And um, this is also so historically accurate. Um, I love how she also like, there was um, an episode or two where they talked about, um, they showed the time when Madonna's hit song, Vogue, um, like just came, was, was just released in the 80s. And they showed how like Madonna gave like no credit for the song and the dance moves and how that came from the New York um, trans like ball scene. And um, I think that also just showed like how black women particularly and queer women like, just create so much for the world. Like they put in so much labor, creativity, um, ingenuity, all sorts of things into the world and they don't get credited for it. So 
I really like that the show touches on so many things. It's it's perfect. Like if you're looking to understand, because it's also just so enjoyable and the characters are relatable. I think even if you're not queer or trans. Um, so I I just I love um, what Janet Mock is doing with that. Like I think she's really redefining what TV can be. Um, um, so yeah. I, I'd say Janet Rock, she's the first person that came to my mind. Okay, this was, this was easy for me because she's someone who I really hold dearly to my heart and that's my grandmother. Um, that's my mother's mom, who I refer to as my ma. Um, she, oh, she's phenomenal. She's in her mid seventies, she lives in Durban. She practically raised me because my parents were working. And with her as, a young married woman with my mom and my brother. She was prim- the primarily uh, the breadwinner in, her f- in the family. So she was a seamstress and she still actually is still a seamstress. And she, you know, would go to work and constantly ensure that there was food on the table, uh, ensure that they had a roof over their heads. Uh, always pushed my mom, you know, she, my mom was the first person in her family, like not even the only woman, the first person in our family who went to university and pushed her to be exceptional, to, you know, not let the circumstances, because my, my, my family, my mom and her family were really poor uh, back in the day. Um, so they were just living, you know, the bare minimum. So my grandmother always pushed uh, my mom uh, to, you know, go beyond what society expects of her and you know if it wasn't for my grandmother my mom would not be the woman that she is today and even now and you know she's one of the sweetest humans i know she's my grandmother but she is so open to so all of these ideas like we can talk about you know the lgbtq community and we can have a whole discussion about that and what's going on in the world we can talk about feminism and she's also with my sister and i she's always you know, telling us, you know, don't let anything around the world, you know, bring you down. Always fight, 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 fight till your last breath. Because as long as you fight, you win. That's how you win a war by being victorious, knowing that even if the world's against you, you have won. And I love her to bits. She, even up till today, she still is still the breadwinner of her her family. Still, still seamstress. Um, she works very hard, keeps everything intact. She makes amazing food and she's always just been such a positive um, female figure in my life. And I think she's also inspired many women and like her sister, she's ha- she has um, seven sisters um, to also, you know, be empowered, you know, take everything in their stride and that age is not something that should, you know, define them, that they can easily you know, go out into the world and still survive. And even with their daughters, their grandkids, they've always been so empowering of their women, always reminding them of how proud they are. And I'm, I'm actually very blessed that that's what I'm seeing in my own circle of, you know, women empowering women. And that's what is so important, what we need in the society where women should not be seen as competition, but as you know being able to walk hand in hand and to assist each other to that so that we can rise to the occasion and eventually get to that equality stance which we require so that's definitely someone who means the world to me well i think definitely my mother um because she is such a hard worker and um simultaneously stays creative and is always willing to learn you know i never have difficult discussions with her like if there's something that um how do i phrase this i mean she's just so open to learning new things she's not set in her ways uh the way that i think a lot of people of her generation are and um i really admire that about her the fact that she's always willing to learn and um stay creative and stuff and then i think also just the the women that i'm friends with um are inspiring to me someone off the off the top of my head xenia i don't know if you're interviewing her for this but she is constantly working to learn and unlearn um 
things that she's been taught throughout her life and she does it I don't want to say like out loud because it a lot is on Twitter as well but um, she's not quiet about it it's not a, a private learning process I mean it's absolutely fine if it is but I think in order to help other people learn and unlearn she's very vocal about it and I admire that about her as well um, yeah, off the top of my head, I can't think of any more people, but I, I just feel like women in general. <laughs> I admire women in general for being and um, persisting to be despite everything against us. I would, I mean, I know this is supposed to be like about women, but I also think like, I want to reflect on it in a broader sense. So... <laughs> I want to speak about a trans non-binary writer, Akweke Imezi, um, whose work I've been following for a few years now. And I think it's very important because they, they definitely like embody some feminine qualities and also like, obviously because they're non-binary, they embody the resistance of being categorized. Um, but also in their work, there's like a, there is a very strong, presence of resisting patriarchy in many ways so i appreciate that in that like it's it's something that's able to empower women and free men from the burden of 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 having to enforce power on people um so i think that's someone who's like opened my mind quite a bit in terms of understanding like our current context of relating to each other um, especially regarding gender um, 